All right. How are y'all doing today? Awesome. Well, I'm just going to run you through uh, hopefully a lighthearted overview of how I stumbled my way through engineering into hardware hacking and maybe learn a thing or two on the way, mostly what not to do. Um, so yeah, we'll just we'll dive right into it. And I got some time for questions at the end. So you'll notice the uh, the tents here. Uh, you know, things changed just a little bit instead of uh, how we that should actually have a strike through. But um, it's how I became a hardware hacker. I think it's uh, important for me to note that you know the guy that's in the the other part of the heart in this photo is uh, crucial to this story. He and I were both uh, electro engineering students, worked at a, a restaurant together, um, worked at multiple different jobs, and now you know we're we're back together again. So um, this is actually a funny picture when we were double E's and we took a staged photo. Um, if you can tell, he's soldering with an oscilloscope, and uh, we're not psychology students or faculty. So that's a, a fun little kickstart into our careers. So like I said, I'm just going to run through who I am and then talk about it. Just a few examples of you know, times that I have learned a lesson by mostly screwing up and uh, what that taught me about hardware hacking and how I think it applies. Um, towards the end of this, I'll talk about why everybody should be doing hardware hacking. And you know, the, this, the point of this talk is not to go too far into the weeds on hardware hacking. Find me any other time, and I'm happy to, to nerd out about whatever you want to. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, my name is Caleb Davis. I'm co-founder of Solasec Cybersecurity Consulting. Um, I was an electrical engineer, um, I guess I still kind of am, um, at the University of Texas at Tyler. Um, did a ton of embedded development before that, a lot of ARM core microcontrollers, free RTOS uh, for, for HVAC, so heating, ventilation, air conditioning. We, we always used to say we would close our eyes and pretend it was lasers because it was not that exciting, um, but we did learn a lot along the way, as you'll see. All right, so some, one of the first things that I wanted to, to talk about, um, hopefully you can see here, you know, this is probably the biggest nudge into hardware hacking for me was really just being a terrible electrical engineer and, you know, bad at circuit design and, and all of, you know, all of the things encompassing with that. I think I've gotten a little bit better, hopefully, but, um, you know, one of the things that we often see when we're putting a, a board together is that we'll have to, you know, modify that board or do some sort of rework Right, so, you know, I've, I've got a few examples up above that I'll talk about, but you know, the things that we see commonly are the wrong uh, component footprints. Right, if you lay out a part or if you have to design your own part, um, could be a huge problem. If you get the dimensions off by, you know, even the slightest millimeter, you could be talking about a short in a system. Um, incorrect schematic wiring. I mean, if you're if you're having to route multiple schematics and you are reading tons of data sheets, right, it could be very easy to cross those wires and you know when you cross wires on a schematic it's not a big deal when you turn it on you see that factory installed smoke that i'm sure you know multiple people in here are familiar with um wrong component orientation this is another big one that we've seen where you know screw up try to send the board or the component to the back side of the board instead of the front side get all confused and then now we've got to you know literally flip transistors over and then solder them upside down so we have actually done that recent too recently i would say um and then the last thing accidental shorts um you know i've done this recently as well just throwing a via down on top of traces when you shouldn't and and what that means to uh your life and how sad it's going to be to fix that problem um so some of the learning opportunities i kind of alluded to it already but you know when you have when you have these uh issues that come across you can't i mean you can run a new board and you know, wait that process, and it could be weeks depending on, you know, your lead time for boards. But something that I think is kind of inherent to what we do as, as engineers and tinkerers is that we try to fix it, we try to root cause it, and then that will inform our next design. Um, my argument here is that, you know, a lot of those tools that we just did and took for granted kind of propelled me into hardware hacking because I think that, you know, the first thing you do when you start looking at a uh, hardware board, you need something? I do actually. I believe you uh, made a outrageous speaker request when you signed up for this talk. Oh, good lord! <laughs> uh, and uh, I believe that you asked for the same rider that Nicki Minaj has. I did. When, yes. Okay. So, I have uh, your 24 pack of Dasani. The other half is on ice in an unspecified location. Great. Thank you. Uh, but there is there's the on ice part. I've got your uh, your dried uh, cranberries. I've got your uh, your almonds here, and. Uh, 
I'm going to go out and get your throat drops and your fried chicken. Thank you. Give me I think she said she has Nobu, too, delivered, so <laughs> just let me know where to pick that up. Okay, right. Oh, that's yeah. awesome, man. Thank uh, you. So the last person who had Nobu uh, ended up uh, not being able to speak in this track because she got uh, food poisoning. So oh, I'll okay, great. That. All right, thanks for... Anyway. That, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'll fill in the gaps here because I know y'all are probably trying to figure out what's going on. Um, in the, the CFP, there was a spot for, like, special requests for the speakers, and I... I'm pretty easy going. I don't have any special requests. So I asked for Nicki Minaj's ridiculous set of Sorry, uh, green room what's requests. What's going on? And uh, what, they obliged. What's going on? For, for uh, some reason? Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. I, I am really sorry, but uh, I, we rece just received a cease and desist letter from uh, Nicki Minaj's. Oh. Attorney. Oh, yeah. It, it turns out someone was put out. Oh, and okay. It was Nicki Minaj. I, re I didn't realize she could patent such a thing. Uh, yeah. Hey, I'm Woody. I'm our chief legal officer. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's come to my attention that you've made unauthorized use of my client's copyrighted work entitled Performance and Security Contract Addendum for Anika Tanya Miraj, <laughs> a.k.a. Nikki Minaj, in preparation of an outrageous speaker request for your 2024 conference. Yep. We reserved all rights in performance and security contract uh, addendum for Nika Tanya Mraz, blah, 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 blah. It's too much. Uh, first published to the world in February 4th, 2012. So <laughs> give me a second to keep reading this. Uh, demand that you immediately cease and desist the operation and delivery of the outrageous speaker request. But, all right. okay, okay. All right. well, wait a second, wait a second. So I think her speaker, her writer says, among the other things, you are bringing the fried chicken, right? Oh, Any, all right, cool. But it said 24? And we've got half on ice and half here. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, we don't have 24 anymore, so All right. okay. we've desisted. <laughs> Enjoy the we letter. are desisted? We have desisted. Okay, great. Have Thank a you. great talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Y'all are awesome. That's so funny. <laughs> All right, well, another example of, you know, sometimes decisions that you make can have real impacts on, on how things work out. Um, but yeah, that that's hilarious. I can't I can't believe that they actually obliged, and I'm really looking forward to the fried chicken that they say is there, and I very much doubt it is. All right. Uh, so getting getting back the overall learning opportunities. Um, like I said, you, you know when we when we drop down the wrong part, when we drop down wrong orientation, et cetera, um, we've had to depopulate too many parts to count, and a lot of times, you know that. That's going to come in handy, and I'll talk some more about the specific use cases where it does. Um, but you know, the ability to do some of that fine, you know, micro soldering, like I, I talk about later, um, is crucial, right? When you're talking about attacking a microcontroller that's got, you know, I think everyone's talked about, you know, depopping capacitors or something like that for power analysis. If not, I'll talk about it here. Um, but that's a that's a huge part of it. In addition to you know, dead bugging parts, etc. Um, the other thing that we've done. Uh, a tremendous amount of times um, that I, I think does come in handy is just cutting traces. So, you know, if anyone's not familiar, you know, when you lay out a circuit board, you'll have, you know, various layers and those layers will contain copper traces from one to another. It's effectively just like wiring on a breadboard. Um, you know, a lot of times when you do run into those issues with like schematic wiring, um, we will have to get under a microscope, cut a trace, and we'll have to sometimes even solder from that trace, which is what you can see in that picture on the left, solder from one trace to another. Um, this is crucial, and you'll, you'll see in a second why um, having the flexibility to do something like that on a board that may not give you the ability to, to connect. So um, just quickly talking through some of the things that we have done. Um, you know, I, I'll just go through the, uh, the, the bullets here, and I'll talk about some of these pictures. But, you know, Sometimes signals are inaccessible, right? A, a big part of hardware hacking is, you know, leveraging signals uh, and analyzing it, decoding it, um, even, you know, manipulating it. So, you know, when, when those signals are not accessible via some sort of header that you can connect to or some other means, a lot of times you're ha you'll have to hack your way into that signal, right? Whether that's scraping a trace and soldering onto it, um, depopulating a component, or, you know, any, any of those things are kind of in play for you know, hacking those those PCB inner uh, bus communication type signals, um, PCB man in the middle. It, it's the exact same thing. To man in the middle on a PCB, you have to uh, go through tremendous lengths a lot of the time. Um, dead bugging. If anyone's not familiar, it's when you're taking apart or taking apart off of a board and then soldering directly to that part. 
Um, so a lot of times you'll have like a like this AT Mega part will have like a ball grid array under the bottom and it's very fine uh, in between. And then it takes a ton of very meticulous and preci precise soldering to actually attach to those signals and then exfiltrate the data from the board, modify it, redeploy it. You know, the world is your oyster from there. Um, another thing that I, I would love to talk about and, uh, you know, one of the things I can nerd out for, for a while on is side channel analysis. I kind of alluded to it. Um, you know, one of the biggest things for like power analysis, for example, uh, voltage rails, if you're familiar, will often have a ton of capacitors. Capacitors store electricity, right? So to effectively measure things like power or inject a fault, um, you'll often have to modify the board first before doing those types of attacks. Um, and it just makes it, you know, a little more responsive to what you're doing. Um, so depopulating components is crucial if you're even going to start doing side channel analysis. And, oh, just talking about the pictures. So the top left is just an example of a BGA component. You can see kind of the traces moving out to those vias, those holes are called vias. Um, that's a perfect example of if there's a signal that's coming from there that I care about, it may not be exposed on the board if it's not like a, a QFP, which is a specific type of package. Um, so I might have to actually, you know, scrape that trace down and solder to that trace or drop a probe or solder a 30 gauge wire or something like that directly to that trace. So, you know, the, all those steps that we learned for fixing the things can also be applied to this is, is the point. And then in the middle, it, it might be hard to see, especially for those in the back. Um, we've had to do this several times where, you know, you think that you cut the right trace and then you realize you did not cut the right trace and everything ceases to work. Um, and then you have to literally repair a trace. So you, you know, you cut up some 30 gauge wire, you drop it back down and you solder it back together. That's crucial too in hardware hacking, right? You hack the wrong thing and you, you know, hardware denial of service is not really super exciting. Um, so you have to, you fix it a lot of the time. And then the, the picture on the right, I actually did this at one point. This was for a, uh, a clock glitching, I believe, or fault injection of some kind. Um, but that's actually a surface mount resistor that someone had the, th this was not my picture, someone had the ability to pull that up and then place it on one side and then that opens up the ability to connect to both sides of that resistor, which is really, you know, it's, it's more difficult than it might seem. All right, so some other examples that we learned, I mentioned that me and the buddy that I referenced um, started in college, which is where we made a lot of these mistakes early on. Um, really a lot of that stemmed from no money, no mo problems. Um, you know, we were broke college kids and we were trying to be electrical engineers, which turns out is fairly expensive. Um, so a lot of what we had to do there was, you know, try to be resourceful. So some of these boards, like the board on the left, um, we thought we were really smart and sourced a ton of components um, from Mauser. And then, you know, we were like, you know, the, these capacitors are orders of magnitude cheaper than these. I'm going to use these and then realize that they were 0402s and we couldn't pay for pick and place and we had to solder them all by hand. So that's, just to give you an example, 0402 is the part in the middle and that's a matchstick. So, you know, we had to go and solder all of those by hand, whereas we could use something like, you know, the 0805 or even bigger um, and do that exact same thing. We were dumb and young and thought we were just saving a couple cents um, and it turned out to cost a ton of time. But once again, the spirit of the talk is that, you know, that, that gave us the ability to learn and, you know, we've soldered as low as 0201s with the naked eye. And yeah, I think my partner's actually soldered the 01005 under a microscope before. So, you know, I'll get back to, you know, what, what the point of this whole talk is, but, you know, this example of just being, you know, constrained with money and trying to figure things out. I mean, I think that's, that's part of the spirit as well of a hardware hacker because that's often your goal as well. Um, all right. So an another thing that we learned is, you know, we, we often had hostile conditions that, that we started working in. Um, just quickly talking about these pictures. Um, we, like I said, we worked at residential HVAC. We did, it was called system extreme environmental testing. Um, so this was a chamber where we put all the, the outdoor units. Um, it would run and cake it with snow, feet of snow, and it would be freezing temperatures and for some reason we would go and have to debug something that would break in there and we would literally have to debug in these conditions a lot of the time. Um, and this is where, you know, we'll, we'll talk about learning 
um, you know, we, we got the opportunity to learn with some complex tools that I'll talk about in a second. But these were the hostile conditions. Uh, I, I mentioned here that, you know, when you're, when you're freezing and your hands are shivering and you are, are having to do all of these things intricate, at an intricate level uh, with hardware, um, it really uh, lends itself to expedient root cause analysis um, because you want to get out of there as quickly as possible. Um, so just to give you, that, that's me and C. That's one of my business partners up on like a big lift. It also does the opposite where it was like 120 degrees, I think when he was doing this picture. And then the, this thing is called seat, this chamber. Um, so someone thought it would be funny to put a seat in seat. Um, so someone took someone's office chair and threw it in the, the snow room. All right, so let's talk about complex tools. So the tools that we were using in those conditions, um, you know, it, it gave us the opportunity to go and debug um, with these complex things, right? So like a logic analyzer, as you see on the left, um, really used for decoding signals, I think is probably the most important tool to a hardware hacker. Um, you know, the, you've got a, a big range. You can buy cheaper logic analyzers and get by. The, the big thing is when you want to get into, you know, higher sample rate that you'll need, or if you want multiple channels, or if you want the ability to do analog signals relatively well, uh, you can get up into the thousand dollar range with like the Salie Logic 16. Another thing that we use consistently was a portable oscilloscope. So that's actually the third picture. Um, this is just, you know, looking at all kinds of signals and waveforms uh, throughout. You know, we not only were we working on programmatic uh, boards and looking at things like I squared C and SPY and UART, things along those lines, we were also looking at, you know, how discrete circuitry operated. So, you know, we were doing electrical engineering things. Um, up on a, a forklift in the snow um, with uh, the portable oscilloscopes. And the last thing, universal programmers, that's that, that Sager J-Link there. Um, this is crucial. It's crucial for reading uh, firmware from a target or writing firmware you can attach, you can debug on target, you can do a ton of things with that. So it's, those are some of the tools that we would use just to debug in, in our uh, conditions. And you know, a lot of times we would find ourselves um, you know, hooking up a Salie, hooking up an O-scope, wondering, you know, what kind of ridiculous ambient conditions um, are causing this problem. And then, you know, I can't tell you how many times we realized that we plugged in the JTAG header upside down. Um, so this is one of those examples where, you know, a stupid problem at being, you know, you have something unplugged, you've got something plugged in upside down, you've got, you know, X, Y, Z, something, um, but you, you throw all these tools at it and, you know, really it gave us the opportunity to learn how to run these tools, especially in these hostile conditions. All right, next, next lesson that we learned, um, one-way ticket to dependency hell. I think everyone in this room has probably seen something like this at some point, and hopefully it's not too triggering for anybody. Um, but yeah, the, whether it's writing embedded uh, C code or if it's writing you know, some you know, Python requirements or, or whatever it is, um, we'll often run into dependency hell just as general software developers of some kind. Um, so, you know, that, that's the same for hardware, for firmware. Um, you know, what the, the point here is that, you know, dealing with dependency hell and not shunning it away is actually something that's in, incredibly beneficial as well, given that, you know, it, it teaches you more about your specific problem, teaches you more about, you know, in, in my case, how the compilers actually work, um, the way that I'm, you know, linking libraries and, you know, understanding at a fundamental level how the, the code I'm creating gets translated to, you know, machine code in, in my case. Um, and that, to me, that's crucial to a hardware hacker as well because you're, you're starting from that point. You know, if I go pull firmware off of a target, you're starting from bytecode, right? So the ability to get back to something reasonable, um, you know, if, if you have an understanding of, the, not just the dependencies, but the intricacies of the, the code that's being deployed, um, it, it's crucial in, in moving forward there. All right, bonus slide. Uh, I did look up the statute of limitations and they have expired in Texas where I'm from. Um, so I can tell you that a lot of times we had the opportunity to learn all about physical pen testing um, slash B and E, um, mostly due to our general forgetfulness um, if you can see that picture, that's actually the picture of the, uh, the facility that we used to work at. There's a little cage on top that you might not be able to see. 
that cage was added because of my my partner that I keep mentioning. Um, we used to just forget, and we would have to break into the building, full disclosure. Um, so we would have to uh, jump over the fence. We'd have to tailgate. We'd have to, you know, we would clone each other's badges back before it was cool. Um, and then other physical weaknesses, like, you know, we never really picked a lock there. We'd probably get in trouble for that. Um, but, you know, the air can attack is what we use consistently, you know, massive air through the uh, motion sensor, break into the room, which is, you know, these are all the things that we did allegedly. Um, and, you know, it, it's funny now looking at all those opportunities that we, we had no idea. And now, you know, if you look at the list of things we legally get paid to do now, it's the exact same list. So, you know, that, that's another spirit of, you know, the, the point that I want to convey today is that, you know, all of these things that are exciting and fun and, you know, we thought we were just kind of taking for granted as part of our job. Well, not, I guess breaking and entering wasn't part of the job, but the things we were taking for granted could also be applied to, you know, a, a different career entirely. All right, so now I get to nerd out a little bit more. Um, hopefully, you know, all the things that we talked about kind of come to a head when you go deep into the world of hardware hacking. And like I said, the, the point here is I'm not trying to go too deep into hardware hacking. I'm happy to do that with anybody at any point, but you know, you can see some of the same tools um, just with these pictures that we're seeing here. So I'll, I'll briefly talk through some of these and, and figure out, you know, uh, or just kind of allude to uh, what they are, how, how we can use electroengineering to, to get to this point. So fault injection, I guess show of hands, is anyone familiar with like fault injection, like voltage injection type stuff? All right, sweet. Well, I'm definitely gonna like go into a lot of detail then. Um, so if you imagine like, you know, a, an embedded part is gonna read memory at some point in time, especially when it boots. So, you know, a lot of these microcontrollers will have a voltage rail. That voltage rail is powering the core, right? In order for it to read memory properly, um, it, it has to have like a, a good solid connection. It's gotta be fully powered. When you get it into a state where it's not operating entirely well, like sort of kind of a brownout state, um, you can cause it to do faulty memory operations. So something that happens consistently um, and across the board is that if you can change that voltage to the core at a specific time um, when you're targeting specific pieces of the of either the bootloader or the, the way that the firmware operates, you can actually cause an invalid read. And sometimes what happens, especially with bootloaders like ST Micro, if you're familiar with that, um, they will read that and then say, okay, well, that's not the thing that I thought it was. I'm gonna revert to this boot sequence, right? So just to give you an example, the, the default is like level one, right? Where it's kind of a little bit of permission, um, kind of not. If someone enables level three, you can do this type of attack and go back to level one and then you open up a ton of different things that you can do to that target just by doing some basic electrical engineering where you're using a multiplexer to literally switch rails pretty quickly, right? So I think, you know, fault injection or, or any side channel analysis is the, the perfect harmony of electrical engineering and hacking. Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the, in general, hardware hacking, like the, you know, I think the point of hardware hacking, a lot of folks will say, you know, you have physical access, who cares at this point? And I think that's just, it's such a misunderstanding of the capabilities of hardware and how you can secure hardware. So, you know, what, what we're after to get you to your question is firmware. We're after sensitive information. We're after, um, you know, intellectual property, all of those things that we can take that firmware and reverse engineer it and conduct a broader attack at, you know, the infrastructure that's supporting the hardware device, or we can, you know, exploit that IP, uh, gray market attacks are a huge thing with hardware, um, and even just, you know, manipulate something if it's, you know, a, a critical infrastructure component, right, you can manipulate it uh, and cause it to, to perform errant operations, whether it's, you know, flashing a, a device at like a end of line run tester, or, you know, some, some sort of safety operation you can, if you can compromise that, you know, it, it's a major problem, right? Um, so one other thing, I'll talk about power analysis too, because I think it's just, it's awesome. Um, so everyone's familiar with AES, right? AES encryption. 
Uh, okay, cool. So AES, I think the for AES one twenty eight, if you try to brute force it, takes like a billion billion years or something like that. I'm sure someone will correct me afterwards. Um, with with correlated power analysis in certain conditions, certain encryption modes, you can get that to as low as five minutes, right? Because what you can do is you can look at the the power analysis and you can look at the all the permutations of an AES key. And there's a, with some boards, there's a, a property where you can correlate those two data sets and you can uh, infer specifics about the, the operation, the cryptography of the system just by the power analysis, right? So, you know, to, to me as an electrical engineer, reading power and, you know, writing some code to process the data, that's trivial, right? Um, and then if you couple that with the, the cryptography piece of it, you know, we're, we're talking about electrical engineers can, can break into to things that they should not within, with relative ease. Um, and this is, you know, I, I don't want to minimize, like, this, these are microcontrollers that are everywhere. STM microcontrollers, NXP, you know, you name it, they, they're in everything. And with the emergence of IoT, um, you know, it's going to be more and more of a problem. And vendors are just now starting to fix it, much less, you know, your, your run of the mill manufacturer that's trying to get to market as quickly as possible and be as cheap as possible. So, you know, these attacks are not just in academia. These attacks, I think, are going to be more and more pertinent as, as we progress um, and as, as these things become, you know, easier to use, which I, I could talk about more at a later time as well. All right, so what now? Um, this, my, my colleague made me put this quote in there, if hardware hacking is cool, then consider me Miles Davis. I stand by that. I, I, I don't know who Miles Davis is, but hardware hacking is cool. Um, all right, so the, the topics and you know, takeaways that I want to give here, um, the growth mindset and then celebrating small wins. You know, a lot of times we would go and we, we'd have to break into our, our employer, use all their awesome gear and fix all the boards that we broke at school. Um, we didn't, that seemed daunting at the time, it seemed like we were screwing up. It seemed like, um, you know, we didn't know anything about electrical engineering, but you know, the, the things that we were learning, I can see now were completely invaluable. Um, we learned the, re the resilience of, you know, having a broken board and fixing it. We learned all of the specifics of how, um, how to do that and, you know, all, all the skills that we can now apply to our careers. Um, and, you know, the, I think key to that is, is that growth mindset and making sure that you keep track of you know, even when it's terrible and you feel like you're not learning anything, you're banging your head against the wall, it's, it's always progress, right? So making sure that, you know, everyone, uh, as much as I can, everyone has that same mindset moving forward that, you know, it, it's for a greater purpose at some point. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I went, I think five years as a double E, uh, not realizing the world of embedded hardware hacking. And, you know, I tell people now that if anyone would have told me what you could do as an electrical engineer in the world of cybersecurity and hardware hacking, I would have never done anything else. Uh, and I really mean that. I think the, just the, the side channel stuff alone is, is so awesome and fascinating. And, you know, there's a lot of really smart people that know how to do it, but it's a relatively untapped space, I would say. So, you know, taking it and making it more approachable to, you know, good people, hopefully that are making the world more secure. Um, I, I, I would say, why, why do anything else? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last thing, I think this is clear, don't be afraid to fail, right? Failure is where we learn uh, all of our mistakes. I Hopefully I was a little bit uh, vulnerable with all the dumb mistakes that I've made over the past 10 years or so. Um, and, you know, realize now what, what that led to. Now, you know, I'm, uh, I get to hardware hack all the time. And, uh, you know, without without all the failures, without all the challenges that, that I face in my career, that wouldn't have been possible. So that's, that's the biggest takeaway there. And I think that's it. So any, any questions from anybody? All right. In what uh, circumstance you did the uh, physical pen testing if you are into uh, hardware hacking? Physical pen, like breaking into a building? Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the best example, um, we had a, 
a building in downtown LA and uh, you know we we just had to go and we impersonated you know, wore wore the the nice three piece suit and uh, you know walked into the building and realized that they did have like security guards and got scared walked out came back around um, and then we just literally tailgated and uh, tailgated went up to the floor I was sitting next to the CFO um, and just plugged into their network and sat there for about 45 minutes until we got bored and then just left. I mean, it was, it's one of those things that, especially me as a, I don't know if y'all know, I'm from the South, from Texas, um, just general talking to people is pretty easy. Um, and people are too trusting, I would say. So I, I had a pleasant conversation with a lady that uh, almost gave me just the Wi-Fi password just by me asking. So, you know, that's kind of what you're up against a lot of the time is that, you know, I'd rather me do it than somebody else. But, you know, if someone goes to that, those means of, you know, just getting access to your network, it's, it's pretty easy a lot of the time without all the crazy, you know, lock picking air can type stuff. Any other questions? Yeah. What do you think the risk is of people not understanding their hardware? I mean, they've got great software, they've got great programs, but they don't understand what's actually sitting on the board of their backbone or switches, routers and stuff for actual yeah. physical components. Yeah, great question. So. I don't think people understand the downstream impact of how the hardware can interact with the broader ecosystem. So the best example that I have with that is not like, you know, networking gear, it kind of makes sense. You understand that it's kind of the backbone of, of a, uh, an enterprise. But I had one where, you know, something innocuous where it was a, uh, a water filtration system. And that water filtration system had API keys that were stored on target. And I pulled it out of like non-volatile memory on target through a UART interface. And then I took those keys and then I attacked the API. And then I attacked the API. API had indirect object referencing. And then I went from a physical device that probably would get thrown away to I take down your entire API for all of your customers, right? So understanding downstream effects and you know how easy it is to actually reverse engineer something intelligible about a system, I think is the biggest thing that people just miss because they they see it, like I said, they see it as, you know, you have hardware attack, you could just pull the power plug, denial of service, game over. That's not the case. There's a lot more that, that could be done. What's the most questionable thing you see? Oh, gosh. Oh, man. I mean, we, we've seen you are like UART is a universal asynchronous receiving and transmitting, just like a, a serial interface. But we've seen root on UART on advanced devices that have no business exposing root level access to someone with just general physical access. So that's probably the most egregious. I mean, we've seen everything from, you know, unsigned firmware that we could just, you know, I've, I've been able to text the device um, and change the upgrade server with a, an SMS message and then host a malicious uh, firmware file and bypass their signature verification um, to, you know, overwrite that firmware on a embedded device and, you know, lock it out, do some crazy stuff with the IO, you know, agree. There's a lot of egregious that, that goes on out there. So I wanted to actually kind of like reinforce the, 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 the answer that you gave to uh, this uh, gentleman's question. So I, I too am an electronics engineer who somehow managed to get himself a role as an embedded penetration tester. And yeah, this is like, this is, they're paying me to hack. What? Yep. This is so cool. So anyway, yeah, and a lot of threat matrices, having physical access to something is usually considered like pretty low. Like if you, you go ahead and calculate your risk scores, they'll come out low. But this is the caveat. It's just like you said, it's like, so what'll happen is, is a real world, real world attackers, if they wanna like attack your infrastructure, whatever at scale, what they're gonna do is try to get a hold of one of your devices. Yep. And this could be just buying it off eBay and they will attempt to reverse engineer it to find things like what he just talked about, like hard coded API keys in the firmware in clear. So if, if you didn't lock JTAG, then that yep. becomes trivial to dump the firmware. If you did lock JTAG, then you got to, that's when you got to start jumping into things like fault injection and all that to get it out. But mm -hmm. once you do and you get it, then it allow, and you, or you find that, okay, there's hard coded credentials in there and they're the same for every device. Like they're not unique per device. And then 
Yeah, pretty much like what I what he just described. Then it's like okay, then things get really fun. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so for those of us who may have come in a little bit late, would you mind sharing or going back to must have tools or capabilities for yeah, people sure. trying to get in? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think I, I mentioned these because I think these are probably should be top of your list. Logic Analyzer, hands down, is the best. It gives you the ability to decode signals, right? Whether that's inner bus communication um, or, you know, if, if it's something that's like an external signal, sometimes it, that's helpful too. If you don't, you don't want to buy like a custom uh, transceiver for everything like RS-232, 45, whatever. Um, so a, a good logic analyzer, I think it's the best. Um, Universal Programmer is probably second on the list where, you know, you imagine the same same sort of deal with the ability to just be dynamic and, you know, deal with multiple targets. A universal programmer inherently does that where, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, microcontrollers, like like this gentleman mentioned with JTAG, if, if that interface is enabled, you know, you can use JTAG, you can wire up to it, or, you know, a lot of folks will just leave a handy dandy header for you, connect to that, dump the firmware, and then, you know, you got a ton of stuff you can do from there. Uh, last thing I'll say, probably, uh, a, a universal, well, I say universal programmer, that's more of a universal debugger, but a universal programmer, um, to the extent that you can dump like external flash is another big thing where, you know, if you depop something off of a board, you throw it down on something else, you know, a lot of times that's where you'll find like the API keys, hard coded credentials, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, those universal programmers are the same where, you know, different form factor, you can, uh, exfiltrate information from you know memory or, or whatever it is so i'd say those those big three are probably the most i'll give you a bigger list if you want to stop by later hey for someone no I, sorry next oh, okay. Go ahead. okay um for someone wanting to dive deeper into this uh what do you recommend for, for example I, I went to a coding boot camp there's a lot of like online resources for learning yeah. on your own how to code without going through an ee program yeah what do you do on the hardware side of things? Like, I wouldn't know what I'm looking at if I picked up a, uh, a logic analyzer or yeah. an oscilloscope today. How would I learn that on my own? Yeah, that's a great question because I, I don't think, I think it's inherently difficult to learn hardware hacking because, you know, you it, it's very easy if you, if you touch the wrong thing and you solder to the wrong spot, like that factory installed smoke is real. I've seen it a lot of times, right? So um, it, it is more difficult. I think that we're seeing more and more, uh, you know, challenges like, Hack the Box or Try Hack Me are trying to do some more hardware-based things. And there are kits that you can buy online. Um, I actually, if you see me after this, I, I can point you to some stuff. I actually made a uh, an open source, uh, you know, learning environment where you learn some of these things. The, the barrier to entry, though, is always the hardware, right? So getting your hands on something that's cheap enough to understand the, the premise. And then, you know, you can work your way up, you know, nice tools whenever you, you know, you earn your earn your keep and you understand like what's going on. Um, but I would say, you know, there's some great books out there. No Starch Press released um, IOT, Practical IOT Hacking, I think, and then The Hardware Hacker's Handbook. Those are two great books that I'd, I'd mention too. Yeah. Back. Hello. Um, I, I believe you mentioned SMS earlier. Were you referring to a mobile device or just like an embedded yeah. device with LTE or something? Yeah, so a lot of these devices will be cellular for a number of reasons, right? Um, cellular is probably, you know, when something's not close to uh, an access point or, you know, you don't have long-term connection, cellular is often used in a variety of industries. So, you know, the, the risk to cellular is, is crucial, right? And I think that there are a lot of issues with, um, you know, it's less so on the, the cellular piece, there are, there are things that you can look at. I think they're a little more complicated. And then sometimes when you're testing cellular, um, you can get into trouble and like have black vans roll up to your house if you broadcast the wrong signals and like interrupt uh, emergency uh, response. So be careful doing that. Um, but I think one of the biggest things with SMS is just general, you know, improper parsing of, of data and trusting data that you shouldn't. And that's, that's the issue that I ran into. It's like I use SMS as a vehicle to bypass bad signature verification of firmware in addition to, you know, improper access control of, you know, elevated function like firmware updates. So SMS is a vehicle. You can attack that just like anything else. But yeah, it's, it's super prevalent with hardware devices.
So this actually was a really good talk and presentation. There's a, um, a field of systems engineering called anti-tamper. Yeah, yeah. And if anyone here hasn't heard of it, I highly suggest you actually start researching it. Because yeah. there are jobs that not only that pay you to break into systems, but pay you to develop countermeasures mm -hmm. to exactly what you're talking about here. And a lot of that field of study came out of the fields of reliability. So to answer your question, sir, for COTS components like we're talking about here, you can get all the specs and schematics online. Mm -hmm. And that's the first place that our adversaries in certain countries yep. go to first. Yeah, that's a great point. And the best way, the reason why they are surpassing us is because we let it happen. It's because everything is out there. Yep. And that's how you all can obtain this stuff. It's all out there. It's all free. You can get the spec sheets, the data sheets. You can pull it all. And that's where you learn. If you learn how it works, and you can learn how to dismantle it. Yep. Excellent talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, FCCID.io. If you're familiar, like, you know, anything that has an FCC ID on it, go look it up. A lot of times you'll go, you'll be able to dump the entire schematic, the, the testing from FCC. It's just, it's a function of, of exactly what he said. You know, a lot of this is in the open domain. Some vendors are better than others, but you know, just go Google this stuff. Don't read like an a thousand page data sheet, figure out how to read data sheets first. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And then anti-tampering, I know we're, we're almost up on time. Uh, just give you an example. So I mentioned correlated power analysis is what I was talking about. Um, some of these chips will do some crazy stuff like injecting random noise and current consumption, which breaks that correlation. So, you know, I, I can't remember who asked, but in, in the spirit of where we're moving as an industry, we're seeing more and more of components like that that strengthen the hardware at a, at a fundamental level that we need to see more and more. The problem is, you know, it's bomb costs, it's complexity, it's dev time. You know, that's why we're not seeing it as much as we should. All right. Thank you. I think your fried yep. chicken's getting thank cold. Thank you all. So. Appreciate it.